I think that one of the biggest values you can bring as a content creator, information is important, but we live in a world where information is really readily available. And so we need the information that has to be part of it. But I think that the biggest obstacle between people and the transformation they want is limiting beliefs. For some reason, there are things that they believe that are an obstacle that keep them from pursuing the transformation that they want. So, Welcome to Social Post, a podcast brought to you by Meet Edgar. Each week, we bring you a guest to inspire your creativity, breathe new life into your marketing strategy, and get you motivated to take action in your business. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned entrepreneur, you'll walk away feeling like you took your social media marketing multivitamin. Enjoy the interview and remember, what's possible for them is possible for you. And we can't wait to see your success. Welcome back to Social Post, a podcast brought to you by me, Edgar. Today, we are lucky enough to be joined by Kyle Young, who is going to give us so many fun tips to be able to take back to your small businesses when it comes to getting your content out in the world and making sure you're getting a good revenue stream. So Kyle, can you introduce yourself a little bit to start and tell us who you are and what you do? I would be happy to. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Kyle Young. I am the marketing strategist for Ultimate Bundles, which is a company that curates big collections of eBooks and e-courses and has done that for the past eight years and sells them to um, just massive audiences of people through those big affiliate networks that they put together. And I'm also a writer. I've written for sites like the Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, and CNBC, where I share some of the marketing advice I've picked up through eight years of digital marketing consulting. Very nice. So let's dive right in to talk about bundles. Now we are, yeah, we are content creators and we have our content on our own blogs or YouTube or podcasts. But if we have our content just on those platforms, why should we consider actually joining one of these bundles? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it was Lisa Sasevich who coined this term of the irresistible offer. And I have always been a big fan of that as a marketing consultant because I think it's a good standard to have when you're trying to put together something that you want to sell is, does this feel irresistible? Do I feel like I'm trying to have to push someone or manipulate someone to want this? Or does this feel like something that's just such a no brainer, they would definitely want to go get it. And that's why I'm such a big fan of bundles and specifically ultimate bundles is these collections of resources, which, so we have bundles around topics like productivity or personal finance, health. We have one going on right now about herbs and essential oils. We've had photography, just all of these different topics. It'll be a collection sometimes of, you know, 40 different eBooks and e-courses at a legitimate 90 plus percent discount. And I think that anytime you have a truly irresistible offer to share, it's a win. It's a win for you. It's a win for your audience. You know that you're doing the right thing. So even if you don't have a product put together, first of all, you can create products for the bundle. Some products are released when the bundle comes out. A lot of them are products that already existed, but you can always join as an affiliate and just share a great offer with your audience. And, you know, as a marketer, I'm always asking myself, am I telling a good story? For me, it's all kind of about the story that I'm telling. Why, why did I send you this email? That's kind of the story. Why am I in your inbox? And what I love about bundles is they're such an amazing value that it just totally makes sense that I'm trying to tell you about this. It feels really natural and authentic. I wanted to let you know about this collection of resources to help you blog smarter because they're at a huge discount. They're only available for five days and I really didn't want you to miss that. I think that really feels like serving and not so much like selling. And so, yeah, I would totally encourage people even if they don't have paid products to either consider creating one for the bundle or to just promote as an affiliate. Yeah, that collaborative approach really does seem to say, I care about offering you all these resources no matter where they came from and build that goodwill with your audience. So that's really amazing. Um, So if I'm a content creator and I'm looking to actually get my content into one of these bundles, what would you say I could repurpose what I already have? Like I know you said eBooks and courses. Can you talk to me a little bit about some of the things that work really well for these bundles? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, there's so many different topics. So in this case, I imagine, well, I I don't, we'll just use the blogging bundle as an example. But again, we have bundles on just about every topic in the world. So if in our blogging bundle that we had recently, there were resources about how to write better, there were resources about the technical aspects of blogging, there were resources about the tax and legal aspects of blogging, resources about how to get more traffic, 
resources about how to make more money through all the different ways that you could do that. So the mediums are normally eBooks, e-courses, workbooks, mm -hmm. printable checklists, but um, the topics really vary on the bundle. So th that's kind of a tricky question for me, but yeah, I, I would definitely, and this is the same advice I would give to someone I was consulting. You, you don't need to start with some 12 hour e-course to create your first product. You can absolutely put together something that is, you know, just a checklist. People are looking for whatever you've promised them, the transformation, right? And we want the transformation as fast as we can get it. So sometimes I think content creators have this feeling that a 12 hour e-course is more desirable than a five hour e-course. But if they both help me do the same thing, I would much rather accomplish it in five hours than 12 hours. So don't feel like you have to you know, become this YouTuber or have this great video presence or create this enormous amount of content. Just make it exactly as long as it needs to be to deliver on your promise. Oh my gosh, that is such a good tip and one that I know I have to remind myself of all the time. Just because it's longer doesn't mean that it's offering people more value. So when you're actually creating something like this, if you're going out there and creating an ebook, how do you get to know what the most vital information is in order to give someone that transformation they want? Do you do research ahead of time with your audience? Like, do you have any tips for people on that aspect? Yeah, I think that what I would encourage someone to do is work backwards. I would think about what is ultimately where you want to get somebody. So you, you want to get them to point from A to B, right? So think about what does B look like? So if you're in the weight loss space, I consulted for several years with a company to help people lose weight through better nutrition. You want to get them to a place where they feel confident in the choices they're making around food. They know how to prepare those foods. They aren't feeling deprived. They aren't maybe struggling with emotional eating or different, uh, you know, just emotional factors that could contribute to their food choices outside of just, you know, we all know what we need to do maybe, but sometimes we don't want to do it or a lack of motivation. So that's where you want to get them to. And then I would ask, so where are they now? And I would, try to map that out. And then I would just try to plot it in steps. What are the milestones along that journey? And if you can help with one of those steps, if you have a unique way to bring value, maybe you've, I mean, hopefully you have some experience with that struggle and with that transformation, but you can share something that helps them with one of those steps. So, you know, if it's personal finance, we know that they're going to need a budget of some kind. They might want to look for ways to increase their income. They're going to need to understand a little bit better how to invest their money and how to save and plan for retirement. Um, you having those steps mapped out, pick a step and help solve it. Very, very simply put. And that is some of the best advice that I've heard working backwards. That's very cool. So can you talk to me a little bit about some of the copywriting tips that you have being a copywriter when you're putting calls to action in your eBooks or to actually get someone to take the steps and the action you want them to do? What type of copy works really well? Because if I'm just reading an eBook and I want this transformation, that doesn't necessarily I'm going to know that I'm going to take action on it. So how do you actually get the words to get someone to take action? Yeah, that's a really great question. I gave a speech at a conference not too long ago. I only say that because that's what I'm trying to think through in my head right now to remember it. But I think that one of the biggest values you can bring as a content creator, information is important, but we live in a world where information is really readily available. And so we need the information that has to be part of it. But I think that the biggest obstacle between people and the transformation they want is limiting beliefs. For some reason, there are things that they believe that are an obstacle that keep them from pursuing the transformation that they want. So I'll tell you, we have time for a quick story? Yeah, for sure. I okay, love so when I, was, when I was consulting with that weight loss company that I mentioned, I was running a focus group for an in-person curriculum where people would show up in a group setting and there'd be a facilitator who would read through some lessons and then people would talk about them and they'd pick strategies and go home and try it. It was just designed to provide some ongoing accountability for people trying to lose weight. And one time I was in a focus group session with, there was a woman in there who was, she would have, I think, described herself as pretty significantly overweight and she wanted to lose weight, but she said that one of the biggest problems that I have is sugar. And that lesson was about just trying to create an environment where sugar is maybe less of a problem. So if you're walking through the house and the house is just full of sugar, then you, you kind of set yourself up to fail, right? You know, just like an alcoholic probably shouldn't spend a lot of time in a bar. I'm not a, an AA coach, but that, that would make sense to me. Um, we were teaching her how to do that. And she said, well, I, I have to have, I have to have sugar in the house for my kids. I have to have a bunch of candy around. And she said, if I don't have candy in the house for my kids, it means I'm a bad mom. 
And it was a really interesting statement because it was like, well, that's not necessarily true. I mean, that, that's not in any way true. It's not that your kids can't have candy. If you give your kids candy, that, that's fine. But there, there's no rule that says if you don't have candy in the house for your kids at all times, you're a bad mom. But that was a limiting belief she had. And she knew that it was probably a good idea to get some of the sugar out of the house that, you know, if someone is really struggling with that, that they shouldn't have a pantry full of candy bars. But she had this limiting belief that if she were to actually do something about that, it would make her a bad mom. And once she said that, the group was able to talk to her and say, no, you're not a bad mom. You know, your kids can give, give them 50 cents, let them buy something at the vending machine when they're at school, you know, if it's important that they have that. Um, but that doesn't make you a bad mom. And it was incredible. Over the course of the next few weeks, she lost 12 pounds. And she was someone who had really struggled to lose weight. It, it, she had never had any success in that. It, it, she sometimes would maintain, but had never really been able to lose weight. But there's just this limiting belief that if, if the sugar were to leave the house, it would make her a bad mom. So I say all that to say this. You, you're asking, how do you get people to take action? I think you help them overcome their limiting beliefs. You figure out what is the thing in your head that's standing between you and doing what you know. Because a lot of times you already know it, or you already know a lot of it. And if you didn't know it, you could usually go find it. But for me, that's what makes a course or an ebook really valuable and transformational, is when you figure out what that mental hangup is that's keeping them from doing what they want, and you help solve it. And you know, it's different depending on the situation, but some universal ones are just people who are afraid to fail, and you can give them examples of people failing and how nothing terrible happened to them and it was all fine. You know, another universal one might be a lack of confidence in their own abilities. I'm not smart enough to do this. I, I love the copywriting headlines that'll say, you know, how to write your first book, even if you flunked high school English or something like that, even if something or other. It's just designed to say anybody can do it. Yeah, I'm scared of roller coasters. And whenever I'm in line for a roller coaster, because my wife loves them, I try to find like the littlest kid I can, I can, you know, just somebody who's just maybe a 12 year old in line for the roller coaster. And I think, okay, if she can do it, you can do it, Kyle, you're 30, you, you need to, you need to, just figure this out. So I think that's another limiting belief you can help people overcome is just show them people who resemble them having success. And that's actually a big principle of the theory of self-efficacy is that when we see people like us succeeding, it gives us confidence. So I, I, that was a very long answer to a very short question, but I think the biggest way you can get people to take action on the strategies you're giving them is to help them overcome their limiting beliefs. Oh, I'm so glad you took the time to tell that story because I feel like just as we started out this discussion, you said that stories are what people want. They make people remember things. And I think this idea um, of limiting beliefs can be hard to actually conceptualize, but when you put it in those terms, so easy to understand. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Yeah, um, so you also mentioned that you're writing for a lot of publications these days, like Fast Company, Harvard Business Review. Are there any things that topics that you are seeing actually emerge these days for 2021 that we should be paying attention to in the marketing world um, if we're really starting to book out our calendars and stuff like that as content creators? It's an interesting question um, because right now, obviously, the media cycle is really saturated with content about coronavirus, content about the election and the transition following the election. So in some ways, it can be difficult to maybe get a publisher's attention in the same way that you would in a normal year. I think that what hasn't changed are the things that are seasonal and built into our calendars. So for example, Black Friday's coming up. I'm actually working on an article right now that is about how to choose the right television. And it's just meant to be tips that are surprising and stuff you wouldn't expect. It's not about going into different brands. It's basically, so a tip that I learned when I bought a TV recently is when you go into the store and they have the demo on where it's, you know, the butterfly or like the hummingbird drinking the nectar out of the flower and it just looks incredible, say, great. And then have them turn it to something you would actually watch. Say, so now put a football game on on this TV because the demo is designed to make that TV look perfect. So get them to put a football game on that TV and a football game on the TV next to it and then make a decision based on that, not based on how the hummingbird looks. I've always thought it was hilarious that when you watch television and there's a commercial for a TV, they'll show you that. They'll show you some beautiful hummingbird and you think, oh my gosh, that TV looks incredible. That's your TV doing that. That's not the TV in the commercial, your TV. You just need to watch more shows about hummingbirds. Like that's, that's all I ever take from those. But um, so that's an example, Black Friday, anything about those types of decisions, the holidays, that there's still gonna be demand for that no matter how much, how many virus articles there are or political articles there are. The new year is another big one to write around. Everybody is trying to recommit to different goals or trying to do planning. I think there's a lot of opportunity for topics about that. And then always just, finding opportunities to help people in the context of what is going on. So say with the virus, an article that I wrote recently was about how to host a virtual birthday party. So 
what if I'm wanting to celebrate with somebody, but I don't feel safe spending time with them or, or there's restrictions in my area that make it impossible? Um, how can I do that virtually and still make it a great experience? So I would look at the calendar, look at what's coming up. I have a, a friend who calls those high emotional holy days, but just the different, you know, there's going to need to be content about Thanksgiving. There's going to need to be content about Christmas. There's going to need to be content about New Year's. There's going to need to be, need to be content about planning for 2021. So that's not a perfect answer, but that's what I would recommend because those are the things that are going to show up no matter how many distractions there are. That's such a great answer. And I feel like we got some awesome life advice thrown in there with that TV tip right there. I've never <laughs> thought about that, but you're so right. Of course, they're going to put something on there. That looks perfect. Yeah, it'll look amazing. It's funny. Everybody's trying to sell these 4K TVs and there's so few shows that are actually in 4K, but it's, yeah. you know, it's fine. But anyway. That's really funny, huh? Um, okay, so when you're actually being a content creator, and we've talked a lot about adding value to the things that are going on in the world right now, and making sure your content really resonates with people in that sense. If I'm just creating content similar to this piece on TV that you mentioned, and it's not mentioning any brands, it's not actually going and like selling anything, how does that actually help me as a content creator get my name out there? Like, what are some things that you can offer? offer to our audience who feel like, oh my gosh, I feel like I need to always offer value, but I need to be selling, blah, blah, blah. Like, where's that mix right there? And how do these things actually help your brand? Whew. Okay. So I have what may be kind of a unique opinion and maybe even a little bit of an unpopular opinion about this, but have you ever heard the story of the person who traded a paper clip up until they had a house? You heard that story where they, they started no. with like a paper clip and they traded it for a rubber band and they traded okay. that for like a, you know, I don't know, some Legos and he wrote a book about it, I think, but he ultimately traded his way all the way up until he had a house just by starting with this thing. That's kind of how I see it in terms mm -hmm. of the value that I see from guest posting is it moves me one step closer to bigger publications. So ultimately there's a lot of value that comes from, I mean, you know, we start out this episode by saying, well, I've written for the Harvard Business Review, Fast Company, CNBC. That's something that makes people want to have me on a podcast and wants to get, want to get my advice as a consultant or as a guest speaker. And so for me, a lot of guest posting and, and writing articles is about just bringing value in the context of that article in a way where you can point back to it and use it to ultimately guest post for a bigger publication, a bigger publication. I have a goal of one day writing for sites like say the New York Times. I've never written for the New York Times, but I have a much better chance of that now that I've written for the Harvard Business Review than I did when I had only written for Vast Company or only written for CNBC and so on and so forth. So for me as a consultant, simply being able to say my ideas have been published in these publications brings a lot of value to my business because people are more likely to trust my marketing advice if big websites were willing to talk about it. So I, I'm never worried about selling in articles like that. I see that as an opportunity to build my own credibility, which is really helpful as a consultant. When it comes to driving traffic back to your business, you know, I have I, I have written guest posts before where I remember I had a link once, it was just a link to an article on my site that was supporting content. And I didn't even really try to I didn't even really try to draw attention to it. It was just, if you wanted to understand these certain pricing models, click here and it was going to take you to an article. And I think I had like 600 people come to my website through a link that I wasn't even really trying to drive people to. So you certainly can drive traffic through that. You certainly can get exposure through that. Um, but for me, it's normally either trying to build my resume so that people trust my ideas. And it would be the same thing to be true if I was a course creator. If I'm putting my advice in a course instead of in say a, a coaching call, being able to say that I'm somebody who's been featured in these places brings a lot of credibility. And that's important because when you're purchasing someone's advice, you, you can't test drive advice as, as in the same way you can test drive a car. I kind of need to trust you before I can even purchase this thing. So that's a way to do that. I also use guest posting a lot to build relationships. I've built a lot of relationships by writing a great article for someone else's website, trying to make their life and day easier, uh, giving them something they can publish and feel proud of, and then having somebody who I can reach out to and get to know better and usually there's some collaboration there. Yeah, that's really cool. And I do not think that'll be an unpopular opinion at all with our audience here. Well, I know a lot of people want to drive traffic, but it's just, it's, oh, not, yeah. my, it's not my primary goal. I believe in driving traffic. It's just not normally how I do it. That playing the long game makes a ton of sense. So it sounds like you have a really great personal brand out there when you're offering value to all these different publications and you're meeting all these people and building these relationships. Do you use social media in any way for your personal brand and like actually building these relationships? 
My honest answer is I don't a lot. And I'm sure that's the wrong answer or for, excuse me, <laughs> for the Meet Edgar podcast. But um, I, I don't use a lot of social media personally. Um, and I think that actually is because, and this is universal advice that I think is something that everybody can benefit from. I don't really enjoy being on social media. That's just not something that I like. I would much rather be in, I have a lot more fun investing in SEO. I have a lot more fun um, meeting somebody on a call. So I think that the strategies that are going to work the best for you are the ones that you enjoy enough to do consistently. And for whatever reason, I don't enjoy social media enough to do it consistently. It can be an incredibly powerful tool for the people who do stick with it. I'm currently working with an author right now who has a really big book advance and is about to have a really big book launch, has no email list actually, but has 90,000 Twitter followers. And that has been a huge factor in him getting a big book deal. So I'm not in any way disputing the power of social media, but for me, you can only do so many things and I wanna do the things that for whatever reason, bring me energy and make me excited to come back to it. Because if I don't enjoy them, I know that I'll quit. And there's really no strategy that works well if you quit halfway through. No, that makes complete sense. And that was totally a good answer because being a social media automation tool, we have a lot of people who have a very similar opinion to you that they just don't enjoy social media, but they know it's a necessary evil a lot of the time. So the more that they can make sure that they don't have to go onto those platforms themselves and post, the more likely it is they'll actually do it. So I think that makes a ton of sense. I totally um, agree with that. And I have a client yeah. who I, I manage a really big social media account for, and I use scheduling tool because it exactly what you said is it's something that allows you to I, I spend probably two hours a week in that scheduling tool and I'm able to schedule social for the entire week and so I, I totally agree with that and totally agree that it's a way to make that strategy more accessible so I, I'm 100% with you on that. Very cool. So as we wrap up here, I'd love just to revisit Ultimate Bundles and what you yeah. guys do there real quick and talk a little bit about if I am someone who is having a really good time creating my courses and eBooks, what kind of bundles do you guys have coming up? How do we reach out to you to actually see if that bundle would be a good fit or to become an affiliate? And what's the process for actually joining that? Yeah, absolutely. So some bundles coming up. There's a personal finance bundle coming up. There's a productivity bundle coming up. There's a decluttering bundle coming up. Um, but we have all kinds of different bundles over the course of the year. We, we kind of divide our big, big, big buckets into health, lifestyle, and business. So if you are can relate to health, lifestyle, or business, there's likely a place for you. We recently had a bundle that was about like knitting and crocheting. We, we've done just about everything. So there will almost certainly be a bundle that would be a fit for your list. Uh, even if it's not necessarily what you talk about normally, a lot of these topics like health are so universal that there's mm -hmm. you know an opportunity for you to uh, help promote that. So there's three ways that you can be involved in a bundle. You can be a contributor, and that's where you put a resource into the bundle. You get a preferred commission rate if you actually contribute a resource. But if you don't have a resource or you don't have time to create a resource, you can be just an affiliate and promote the bundle. And you know that's just about putting things on social, sending emails, and using your affiliate link. Uh, third, you can be a bonus partner. And so that's, this is best a lot of times for companies that have tools or physical products. And I actually should probably kick this one back to you because I believe you guys have been bonus partners in several bundles. Yeah, we sure have. And they've worked amazingly for us. <laughs> So those are the three ways you can be involved. I, how to do it, I would just go to ultimatebundles.com. We've paid out over $8 million in commissions. And as you scroll down that page, you'll see how to become an affiliate, become a contributor, become a bonus partner. And we would love to have you. You know, what I love about bundles is, like I said, they're that irresistible offer. And I feel like they build a lot of marketing strategies in right from the start because you have a really great story to tell. You have a, a discount that makes sense to be time sensitive because these people have have put this big discount on their products and it, you know it makes sense that that wouldn't be forever sometimes you see these deadlines we know that deadlines are so important in marketing because we're all procrastinators and we all need something to kind of nudge us and, and whether you're selling online or whether you're you know target running a sale on toilet paper or whatever else everybody's using this because we know it's important but sometimes deadlines feel really artificial. It's just, well, this is going away now. It's like, well, why is it going away? You know, it doesn't really make sense that it's going away and it's kind of a lousy story and you don't feel great about it. And your customers don't feel great about it. This is dozens of people have discounted their resources at an enormous degree and that they are going to go back to selling them full price. So th there's just a really clean story to tell with urgency built in. There's a lot of social proof built in because there's all these different people participating in the bundle. So you, you think, you know, well, gosh, if, if all these reputable people are a part of this, then I should be a part of it too. 
it's a great opportunity for you to be part of a collection that will almost always feature names that are currently a lot bigger than yours. So say you're in our blogging bundle, uh, people we've had in past blogging bundles are like Ruth Sukup and Darren Rouse and Jeff Goins and Crystal Payne. A lot of really successful bloggers, you're going to have an opportunity to be a part of a collection alongside their resources. And that's a great opportunity. We have a Facebook group for our affiliates where you can meet like-minded people so or other bloggers and content creators. And I absolutely encourage you to be a part of it. If you don't have a product, just be an affiliate. You, you don't need to create something. You don't need to have already had a course put together. But uh, I think it's a huge step forward. And, and we have a lot of members of our community whose businesses really grew almost solely from Ultimate Bundles. This was how they monetized their platform for a long time. And some of them have gone on to write books and get speaking gigs and do things other ways. But And then that's great. We 100% celebrate that. But this can be a really foundational growth tool for bloggers. Oh, very excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of these tips. I know our community is going to get a ton of wealth out of them. And I completely agree. The marketing foundational aspects built into bundles have worked amazingly for us here at Meet Edgar. So guys, go check out Ultimate Bundles. If you are a content creator or a, even a software company like us, because it is an awesome way to get your name out there. And as Kyle mentioned, to be associated with these bigger names. Kyle, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your tips today. Thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun. Thanks so much for tuning in and be sure to keep the conversation going with us on social. We're at meet Edgar on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So let us know your biggest takeaway from today's episode. And don't forget to tag us. Visit www.meetedgar.com and start a free trial to up-level your social media marketing strategy today. Happy posting.